Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti a questa nuova giornata di laboratorio Pendata in Action. Eh, diciamo, faccio un piccolo accenno in italiano e poi diciamo, passo subito a parlare in inglese perché abbiamo un relatore internazionale per questa giornata, Nicolas Kaiser Brill. Quindi mi scuso, con, ma dobbiamo oggi necessariamente eh, rivolgerci al pubblico presente, al pubblico che ci segue da casa nella lingua inglese. Um, hi everybody, today welcome to this new, journey, this new day for this Laboratorio dal Basso Open Data in Action. Today our guest, we are very proud to have him as our guest, our teacher, is Nicolas Kaiser Brill, who will talk today about the relationship between the open data and the journalism. Um, I have to tell you, I was quite impressed by the CV of Nicolas because he is quite young, as you can see, but his exp work experience and study are qu very, very important for this field. In particular, Nicolas is a teacher of the European Journal Center and his focus, uh, is, um, I was taking a look actually on your website and I was quite struck from um, some words you used, the way you scratch and uh, use the data to, uh, to for journal quality journalism. It was something that really impressed because actually I work as a, a journalist for a local uh, magazine here uh, near Bari. And this is, um, I mean, common situation in Italy, maybe all over the world, the publishing um, uh, business, the publishing market, and the journals, journalism in general, is facing a very deep crisis. And um, many people, including me, um, ask to ourselves how to go on with the journalists, uh, with the new media, how to face the crisis, the economic crisis, the publishing crisis. So today's lesson may be helpful for us to understand new ways of making report, new ways to have very good journal, quality journalism. And Nicolas will teach us some uh, something today. I mean, we are very curious to listen for him. Thank you very much for your presence. Se qualcuno ha domande può chiedere il microfono giusto per chi ci segue da casa, perché senza microfono non ci sentono. E se qualcuno ha problemi con l'inglese, non ci dovrebbero essere problemi, se qualcuno ha problemi con l'inglese mi, mi può chiedere e traduco al volo. Uh, how do you go full screen on uh, Windows? Um. Oh, sorry. Oh, here you go. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, b um, what I wanted to do this morning, I just uh, I have this presentation here about data journalism in general because I've been told to do something very generic, but I think it's better if uh, we all take this opportunity to uh, discuss about it. I, I don't know what's your um, uh, what's your knowledge of the topic, what you guys have been uh, doing in terms of data and journalism and bringing open data into the mix. Um, but I mean, I hope we can take the next uh, the, the next few uh, hours to to discuss this. Um, just a few words on uh, on myself before um, I, I'm I, I'm not a journalist and uh, and I'm not a developer. I have to confess, uh, I've uh, studied economics. Um, I, I uh, started uh, I, I've learned how to program when I was a, a kid, and I've been doing this for the past 15 years now. Uh, and I did some journalism on the side as well when I was like a uh, teenager, when I was at university. Um, and I kind of left journalism when I saw that it was uh, not the most exciting field to work on. And I, I came back to it uh, five years ago quite randomly. And since then, uh, I have with others tried to bring together computer science and journalism to see what where it could lead to. Uh, and the experiment uh, so far is quite uh, successful. So I've been doing that with uh, a French company called OVNI uh, in 2009-2010. 
uh, and in 2011, um, I created my own company called Journalism Plus Plus with um, w a, a c former colleague of mine. Uh, and today we are uh, seven people working from Paris and Berlin, uh, and we have uh, sister companies in uh, Amsterdam, Stockholm, uh, and Cologne. So, um, I don't know, do, do, do you, uh, wha what, what do you guys know of, uh, of data journalism? So I don't uh, bother you with stuff that you already know, or how, how involved are you in the topic? Or oh yeah, and do tell me if, uh, if I speak too fast. Abbiamo qualche esperienza pregressa con the actually no, we are um, we have some experience with open data, but not focused on uh, data journalism. Okay. Uh, except PR maybe. I've started uh, studying uh, data journalism uh, since uh, December, uh, and uh, I'm learning uh, instruments and tool and. Uh, uh, stuff like like this, and uh, uh, I like telling stories, and uh, I want to learn how I can make, I can write them with data. Okay, cool. Um, so I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's quite a buzzword, um, and frankly, uh, at the beginning when we started doing data journalism, uh, first of all, we didn't know that we were doing it. Uh, it was like people tell uh, told us. Uh, oh, you're doing data journalism, and uh, okay, why not? And and f yeah. 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 No, no. It, it's it's a vast uh, it, it's a vast uh, topic, uh, and that was actually the title of my first slide. Uh, that it's it's really um, too too vast to be um, defined in a very clear way. I mean, we've made progresses in the past few years, but I think it's easier to um, to look at it uh, using examples. Um, and I think the best example of what data journalism is uh, starts with this uh, this question: What what do you do if tomorrow in your uh, inbox you receive a letter with a hard drive containing 260 gigabytes of information? Uh, and I think not many journalists uh, in 2013 know how to answer this, uh, which is too bad because that's exactly how uh, the offshore leaks story started. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the offshore leaks um, the, um, yeah, series of articles. No, uh, it's something that was um, uh, that was done by um, ICIJ uh, earlier this year. Uh, maybe there was an Italian title to it because I'm pretty sure some Italian media organizations were partners uh, in, in this story. Uh, so, so basically what happened is that uh, ICIJ in, in uh, Washington uh, received this hard drive containing 260 gigabytes of information uh, and the data was actually from a few companies in Singapore and the British Virgin Islands and contained uh, a lot of information about secret banks, bank accounts uh, in these uh, tax havens. Um, and so what, what these uh, group of journalists did is first of all they um, uh, analyzed the hard drive because the data was in a, some strange format, I mean it wasn't easy to, to read and understand. Uh, and then they had this list of thousands and thousands of, of names connected to bank accounts, connected to um, uh, shadow companies. Uh, so they had to make sense of all of it and, and there was quite a lot of um, network analysis involved. Um, and, and what's interesting in this is that they, they had to use a wide array of techniques from just reading the hard drive because it's, it's not easy when you have something you have no idea where it comes from so you need to to have some security and forensics capabilities uh, and and then they went into this um, data cleaning process and network analysis uh, and once they had a sense of what the data was like they had to find the stories because it's uh, it doesn't bring you anything if you just have a list of names connected to bank accounts. So they had to do... Th How they uh, made uh, this uh, uh, research uh, um, 
without uh, um, black uh, um, privacy rules? No, it's strange. Uh, that's that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mean in the sense that uh, under EU law you don't have the right to uh, make a list of uh, personalities? Uh, I believe. Sorry, these are supposed to be private data, aren't they? That, that was private data. Uh, I believe. I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but I, I believe uh, one of the limitation of the privacy legislation in Europe is that if you have a journalistic goal or educational educational goal, uh, you you have the right to do this. I, I believe the limitation only applies to commercial uh, enterprises. Sorry, not the quote, but when did it happen? So they they received the data uh, two years ago, and they published it six months ago. So it was in uh, April 2013, I believe, that they went public. No, I was remembering, I don't know, something similar in Greece a couple of years ago when a journalist got a list of people who had secret bank accounts uh, somewhere. It was related to the problem of corruption in Greece and... I mean, mm -hmm. different kind of story. I, I think it's a, it's a different kind of story because in Europe it didn't have... No, maybe, maybe this the story I refer to yeah. right now doesn't have any, nothing to do with open data, but it was, I mean, maybe they I share uh, th th uh, with data, data. Uh, I mean, with uh, data, but uh, it doesn't have nothing to share. No, no, no I I in this story, uh, because most of the bank accounts were in Singapore and the British Virgin Islands, uh, most of the people involved were from mm. uh, the Americas and Asia, uh, but still, I mean, um, th th they did some interesting research and they were able to show, for instance, how I think uh, one minister in South Korea had uh, embezzled uh, quite a lot of money through all these uh, offshore accounts. So the guy resigned. Uh, another minister in Mongolia resigned because of this. Uh, recently they were able to, um, t to investigate a network of shadow companies. Didn't they find anything about Berlusconi? <laughs> I don't know, but that's that's where it gets interesting, uh, because uh, a few months after the um, data was released, uh, they actually published, um, made everything public, so you can now search through it. Um, sorry. Uh, and that's... Also, the interesting thing about this investigation is that they almost did everything uh, like perfectly. So they, they first of all, they published, they, they found the stories, published them uh, with a consortium of uh, newspapers throughout the world. And a few months, once the story was like winding down, they published all the data using uh, an interesting, I mean, an easy to use interface. So uh, we can now search. Um, oops. We can find the people in Barry mm -hmm. with offshore accounts. No one. No, one. no come on. Well, after this, uh, this last. Um, <laughs> Yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, and it, it gives uh, it gives a good idea of uh, of what the data looks like because basically just looking for Berlusconi, um, y you have may maybe he's behind one of these. We have no idea, uh, but the the data is uh, is just the starting point. Sure. So, yeah. Er. Anyway. Well, that that was just um, an example uh, okay um, and th this one about offshore leaks was like an international consortium uh, with uh, some resources. What's interesting is that you have the same kind of stories at the very, very local level uh, with people with much less resources and uh, in this case so we had uh, this international investigation and I'm, I'm going to argue that the same is possible at the level of a small Belgian town. 
uh, and in this case it's uh, it's uh, somebody I um, I trained like two years ago and after the training he went on to uh, analyze uh, the uh, wages of Myers in Belgium and he was able to show that uh, between neighboring cities you actually had differences ranging from one to five uh, without anyone knowing why so he just published a simple map showing the differences between uh, the, the wages of the Myers. Uh, and it was interesting because in this small province of French-speaking Belgium, um, it created a, a, an interesting debate. Uh, I don't know if uh, they, they, they came up with a solution for this, uh, but my point is really that in this case it was just one journalist in a small newsroom. He just went for the list of data uh, put it on a map, and it created this uh, civic debate, which, which I think journalist, journalism is, is, uh, is about. So it's, it, it really works at all uh, scales. Um, and yeah, um, to, to, to go further, um, you have a lot of examples. Um, as, um, as an aside, by the way, the, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you want to follow along, Yes, uh, you can find the links to the examples on the presentation. The address is press.nkb.fr forward slash intro minus ddj minus Barry. Yeah, sure, you can, uh, you're encouraged to uh, <laughs> share it. Um, it's all in Creative Commons, so uh, feel free to, uh, to, to copy and share. Uh, so yeah, and you can find the, the links for further reference. Uh, but you have interesting uh, investigations everywhere, and it's really not about the US, and it's not about the UK, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, this is an example um, of an investigation that was done two years ago by a friend of mine at uh, Le Monde in Paris. Uh, they scraped, I mean, they, they searched for all the um, MDs, all the physicians, the doctors, in several French cities, and for each one of them there was, so in this case we're talking about open data, uh, the the um, price of a visit to these doctors was public, but uh, there was no aggregation. Um, and so what Le Monde did is they just they took all this data and then they aggreg aggregated it by city uh, and they were able to show that, for instance, if you go to some doctors in the richest parts of Paris, you, have, you, you might pay up to 500 euros for a 30-minute uh, session. Uh, which is obviously way uh, higher than the, than the, uh, than the average. Uh, and and um, it had some interesting consequences because uh, the same story had been done a few years before and the French health system then pledged to reform itself and they obviously didn't do it. Uh, and using the techniques of data journalism, uh, we are able to do these kind of investigations in, in, a, in a much more, uh, in a much faster way, in a much uh, more efficient way. So it costs less, and it means that watchdog journalism can be do done more often at a lesser cost. Um, so yeah, an example from France. Uh, there was this example which I believe you're familiar with, uh, done by uh, Wade yeah. Italia, uh, on th on the uh, safety of public schools here uh, in the face of. Um, earthquakes. So again, um, th this was th this one was much uh, much less cost effective uh, in the sense that they had to um, clean the data by hand, uh, and I mean they, they they did all kind of uh, of things uh, to the data. But in the end, they, uh, they had this interesting investigation, which I believed, uh, which I believe was quite successful, or was it not? Hey, a, a question about yeah. uh, the. Um, French uh, yeah. work. Uh, uh, what about the data of this? Ch uh, do you have? Uh, I don't understand very well. Um, um, did you have uh, open data about this uh, story? So um, I, um, I'll try to, to find the link, uh, but I don't have it in mind. So basically, uh, and, and that's that's interesting because it it gets into privacy here. Uh, so the, the question: Who did release this? So yeah, the, the health authority, like, like the French social security, uh, had uh, by law they had to uh, inform uh, the patients about the prices of the doctors, but they did it in in a way that you really cannot aggregate anything. So they have this online interface, 
um, and you type the name of your doctor and you have the results uh, for your doctor and your doctor only. So you cannot really compare and you cannot make a request like find the cheapest doctor in the area. Uh, and so what Le Monde did is they found like a workaround to actually extract everything. Uh, and in this way, uh, they were able to get the data, but they did not dare release it because they were afraid that they would uh, come under this uh, privacy law. Uh, and, and that was also the argument by the social security that it was okay to publish, but it was not okay to aggregate because, I don't know, I mean, it, 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 it's a pretty flimsy argument. Uh, I think it's it's really it doesn't uh, make sense and it would uh, it wouldn't hold uh, um, in front of a court, uh, but I don't believe any European media uh, ever tried to challenge these privacy regulations uh, in front of a of a court. Um, I don't know. Do you have examples in Italy? No. Nope. <laughs> oh, too bad. Um, so a another cool example. Um, th that was, uh, I don't know if you followed the, the, the vote in Germany, uh, but basically did sites, uh, did this uh, nice, uh, what, interactive, where you can actually see uh, how the, the, the voting patterns uh, changed. And basically the, the big story w for the vote was that the uh, FDP, so the Liberal Party, uh, was kicked out of Parliament. Uh, and it's interesting in this way, uh, the, the way they, they uh, visualized how uh, the, the voters uh, changed uh, changed their mind. Um, and what's even more interesting is that they did this, they published this on the very evening of the vote. So they had everything prepared. Uh, they made a template uh, so that they could uh, be very, very fast and e efficient when it came to uh, publishing the uh, interactive story. I'm sorry <laughs> if no I interrupt you. I, I don't understand this this uh, piece. It's a, uh, I try to uh, explain. Um, it's about uh, a politician and their boss uh, about uh, everyday uh, activity of the parliament. I don't know. Oh no, no, it's, it's about the the, um, the voters themselves, like how people. Yeah. So so ah, here. Okay. 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 Here you have like the 15% of the voters who voted for the Liberal Party uh, in 2009 and the same people, uh, only a fraction of them actually voted for the same party uh, five, year, five years, four years later. Uh, I don't know, interactives? Uh, y you have a lot of uh, different names going on for this uh, and, th and that's also the interesting thing that we put everything under the name data-driven journalism uh, even though it covers like a wide array of, uh, of possibilities uh, and, and I think I come back to the, the visualization thing but uh, focusing on the visualization only I think is, uh, is a big mistake uh, but I'll come back to that I think we will have the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I agree 100% uh, with you that uh, here you have a nice visual, but you don't have much of a story. On the other hand, uh, I mean, you know what's election night, you don't have much of a story anyway. No, no. No, no. I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's um, it, it doesn't bring mm, anything uh, to the debate, really. Yeah. Uh, what, what I find interesting is that, um, 
election nights are always uh, big, uh, important moments. I mean, elections in general are important in terms of journalistic uh, timing, uh, where it's only because it's one of the few times in the year that uh, a lot of um, a new people are going to consume news. So in this sense, it's interesting to have more than what everybody else has. Uh, I mean, usually they have, I don't know, Vox uh, Populi, like uh, just interview of normal people, interview politicians. Yeah, d definitely. I mean, it, it, it um, it's interesting in the sense that it keeps the audience engaged uh, more than an article would, uh, and I believe you also um, you can open the way to uh, other stories. Like IFD here uh, is the um, uh, the new extreme right party in Germany. Uh, that was also one of the big things of the votes, and using this app, you can see instantly uh, where the people who voted for them came from and I think it's interesting that uh, actually it's quite well spread. Yes. Uh, you can hear if you, you, you have a, uh, here you have the, the people who died uh, and I think it's interesting because the party that's actually at the, um, like the party of Angela Merkel uh, is the party that has the most voters dying. Uh, which means that as the population of Germany gets older, uh, they might lose influence. Uh, but what I find interesting is that it, it's an interesting way to explore data that was there to begin with. Uh, it makes it more visible and you might find uh, small stories like that. So I don't know how Zeit did it. Maybe uh, they engage people in the comments. Um, but I believe it's, it's a good starting point. Uh, and again, uh, my main point with this was the speed with which they were able to build this. So if you're able to build this as fast as you would an article, uh, then it's, um, it, it's a winning uh, situation. Um, anyway, so my point with, um, uh, wi with these examples was just to try to define data journalism in a uh, in, in a better way uh, and so what do these stories have in common what they have in common is that they have some amount of data uh, it might be uh, something enormous like the uh, 260 gigabytes of the offshore leaks uh, but it might be small like if you take the list of um, the um, salaries of the Myers in Belgium it was like I don't know 15 uh, points of data so it can be small as well. I, I don't think the amount of data has anything to do with uh, um, with the quality of the journalism that y that you get out of it. Uh, the other thing that they have in common was uh, data analysis, uh, trying to explore where the data came from, uh, what does it represent. Um, again, from uh, checking the source of the data in the um, uh, in the offshore leak story to um, um, like. Yeah, checking the, the, the validity of it, uh, trying to find um, patterns in the data, that would be the analysis part. Uh, then you have to visualize it, uh, where whether you do um, the, the uh, data visualization of the sites or so just a map or whatever. Um, and finally, you have to find the story within the data, and that was uh, exactly what we uh, just discussed on the uh, German example, that it's, um, it's, it's not always easy to, uh, to, to find the story in the data. Um, but th but that's, that's where the, the journalism actually takes part, otherwise you're just into uh, data wrangling and you don't need to be a journalist to do it. Um, s something that, um, uh, that lots of people uh, say about data journalism is that you need to have a developer, a journalist and a designer to get started. Uh, and I believe that uh, nothing is less true, that it's good to have these different skills in your team, but you don't uh, need that uh, to uh, get started in data journalism. Um, the, yeah, that was my answer to the question. Um, anyone can do, uh, can do data journalism. Um, because you have um, quite a lot of um, off-the-shelf 
tools, like tools that are easy to use, that are free, uh, that lets you analyze or visualize the data. Uh, so in this example, Tableau Public is um, a data visualization slash analysis tool. Uh, data wrapper and infogram are just data visualization tools. Um, but the, the, the more general point here uh, is that these are free. You don't need any uh, euro of investment to get started. Uh, and you don't need to have uh, a developer uh, with you. Um, what you can also do is to uh, uh, upgrade your your skills, and again, uh, without needing any, um, without needing to hire uh, anyone, uh, you have decent uh, MOOCs, so massive online courses that are free. Um, I believe so right now you only had them in English and Spanish. Um, and this one in uh, February 2014, uh, I'm going to be an instructor in it, but you have uh, others, and again, all free. Um, you have online platforms to learn how to code, uh, because again, in the data visualization and data analysis part, you have a lot of, of uh, technical skills that you need to master to be able to uh, understand the data so uh, coding is definitely uh, part of data journalism. Uh, but again, I don't think you need to have a developer with you to get started. You can um, quite efficiently train yourself. Uh, so the I don't know if you guys are familiar with Code Academy. Yeah? It, it's pretty fantastic to, to learn how to code. Um, and again, it's free. And Code School is basically the same thing. Uh, and you have a wide array of uh, blogs, forums, mailing lists, and books. Uh, and this is the Data Journalism Handbook that was uh, written in 2011. Uh, and again, this is all free. Um, the community is pretty um, easy to get into. Uh, part of the reason for that is that the market is growing, so nobody is feeling threatened by newcomers. Uh, and, and there is uh, really a, a growing community of uh, enthusiastic data journalists. So. Um, if you want to get started, uh, you just register on the mailing list. Um, the one of the Open Knowledge Foundation is a good example, uh, and just say hi uh, and introduce yourself. And quite naturally, you'll find contacts and resources to uh, progress. Um, another thing um, that's that I've seen in every successful uh, data journalism project is um, that people get the ta talent from the outside. Um, again, if uh, we look at the different examples um, that I just showed, uh, you always had um, technicalities uh, that normal people from within the newsroom could not resolve. So in the offshore leaks story, for um, the data format uh, was actually something that was used only in um, in these private banks uh, in the British Virgin Islands, uh, and nobody outside of the financial world uh, knew how to use or read the data. So they had to find s these um, financial data experts. Um, in the um, Italian example, uh, they also had to bring together people from different backgrounds to be able to analyze the data. So it doesn't make sense to um, to try to um, do everything uh, in just one newsroom. And I believe that's something traditional newsrooms are not used to. And that might be one of the reasons why uh, they have so much trouble uh, getting into data journalism. Um, I don't understand very well this uh, last part. Uh, you can repeat it, please. Um, you mean on uh, getting talent from the outside? Uh, uh, wha wha what uh, didn't you understand? Uh, this is the last part Oh, so, so I mean, my, my point right now is just to say that um, there is no way that anybody is going to be able uh, on its own or within a small team, nobody's going to be able to uh, do the data analysis that you need to do in all of these uh, examples. Okay. Um, and my, my uh, just to, to build on this point, uh, sorry, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes. 
Uh, you say that uh, different kind of uh, background, Italian background. What kind of so background? So that's ah, that okay. that's my. Uh, I'm just uh, building on this. Um, one one uh, one set of skills that you need to have uh, absolutely uh, is uh, statistics. Uh, the problem is like if you try to hire a statistician and you're like a medium-sized newsroom, like a medium-sized European newsroom. Uh, first of all, you're not going to have enough work for him or her, uh, and second of all, uh, he's going or she's going to be the best paid person in the newsroom because a statistician, uh, I believe if you have a degree in statistics and uh, go into the job market, uh, entry salary is going to be something in the 100,000 euros per year, something like that. So extremely expensive. Uh, but it's something that you need. I mean, anytime you're doing a data-driven investigation with uh, a large amount of data, you are going to need uh, a statistician or at least some statistics uh, to make sure that you're not uh, misunderstanding the data. Um, even if you're doing something as simple as an average, uh, it's good to have a statistician uh, be uh, besides you uh, who can guide you in, in the process. Uh, but my point with uh, this slide, so that was a meme from 2012, uh, probably you had it in Italy as well, uh, where you had an occupation and then you had six um, uh, slides uh, s sh saying what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do, what society thinks I do, what my boss thinks I do, what I think I do, and finally what I actually do. And here you can see that statisticians uh, see themselves as these uh, very brainy, very nerdy uh, data crunchers. But actually, if you look at the last uh, image, uh, you, you find what statisticians think of, thems of themselves like uh, they are extremely bored um, because, and again, uh, that's why they make so much money because uh, they work mostly in the insurance and banking business or for hedge funds. Uh, and so usually when you're a journalist and you come to them and you say, oh, I'm working on this very exciting investigation, uh, do you want to uh, give me a hand? They're going to be extremely happy to help just because it makes their daily life a, a bit less boring. Uh, so that was one example of uh, what skills you need and how you get it as we try to make friends with statisticians uh, so they can uh, help you out and so you can call them whenever you have a question. Um, so that's uh, one set of skills. Uh, another thing um, that any journalist uh, should do uh, is to make friends with developers. So I think you guys here are pretty, uh, are pretty much, uh, pretty good at this. Um, so you have the hacks and hackers uh, meetups. I don't know if you have hacks and hackers in southern Italy. Uh, no. uh, okay. Okay, that, that might be too far uh, far away for uh, for, for an after work <laughs> drink, but. Uh, basically, y you have uh, Hacks and Hackers is just one example of, uh, of such communities that bring together journalists and developers. Uh, but it's, um, uh, I find, I mean, from what I hear from journalists, it's really one of the hardest parts to find these uh, nerdy, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to find these, uh, these skills. Um, and so yeah, such events are a good uh, way to go. Um, Finally, uh, another way to um, get the skills that you need is to network with other uh, journalists. Uh, to go back to the first example I showed of the uh, offshore leaks, um, it's actually quite a small NGO that started it. So ICIJ is based in Washington. I don't know how much people they have on the payroll, uh, but not many. Uh, but what they do have is an international network of journalists that they can activate uh, whenever they need. So in the end, they had hundreds of people working in investigation um, just because they were able to build this network for one-time events. Uh, and that's a method that was also used uh, by WikiLeaks uh, in 2000, uh, since 2009. Uh, and it's, it works really well. Uh, in this way, you are able to uh, bring resources together that you would never uh, had the chance to um, um, together in normal times, and we see it more and more. Uh, in the Snowden uh, story, uh, it's the same thing. It starts with uh, one journalist, uh, Laura Poitras, 
uh, meeting with this amazing source and what does she do? She, she's not going to one single newsroom to try to get the story out, uh, but she's bringing around her uh, this uh, network of newsrooms. So uh, I think right now we have Garden, Spiegel, uh, New York Times, uh, no, later it was Washington Post, um, Le Monde, El Globo, etc. So that in the end you have yeah, 100 people working on the story uh, and doing things that would not have been uh, possible otherwise. So again, this uh, this way of working, uh, I find uh, maybe for us it's normal. I don't know uh, uh, if you would agree, uh, but what's uh, for yeah? For us, what do you mean? For us, as uh, for us, I mean uh, young technology-driven people who uh, are not uh, used to working in traditional newsrooms. So you're asking us uh, how does it work in Italy? I mean, you refer, uh, if, if for us it's normal, you mean in Italy? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you, you react to this because uh, what, what I find interesting is that for uh, the people around me and, f and for me personally, it was totally normal to, to yeah, build a network around a project. Uh, but when I look at uh, traditional newsrooms, I find they have a hard time just sharing the data uh, building contacts for for short short uh, events. So uh, I, I don't know what's your opinion on that. I think uh, um, that in Italy uh, we are not uh, very uh, ready uh, um, to make something like this. But uh, uh, we are working on it and. Uh, I don't know because I never work in a uh, press agency, mm -hmm. or <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe someone in the <laughs> through the audience. <laughs> do you want to say? It? Do you have an opinion about this? Uh, un attimo, un attimo. An Italian, uh, mm, uh, not news, uh, an Italian news magazine, L'Espresso, uh, worked uh, with, uh, with the Wikileaks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very difficult because uh, uh, there is, a, mm, there is a, a fight against uh, all the uh, newspaper, news magazines in, uh, in Italy, but I think it's... Uh, uh, you have to. Um, we need time to adapt to the um, to this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, only La I, Yes, but uh, La Stampa worked with uh, another network. Sometimes uh, Repubblica uh, worked with uh, other uh, other newspapers. There is a, a news magazine uh, called uh, Internazionale who works only with uh, other uh, newspapers all over the world. So. I personally think as a reader, not as a journalist, that in Italy we have a magazine that who was already mentioned, it's called Internazionale, Internazionale it's based on actually on the idea of a French magazine because they gather articles and reports from magazines and newspapers from all over the world and recently, and they tra translate it in Italian, and they recently are using for almost each number there's a two pages map focused on particular trends all over the world it maybe can resemble the example you gave us before. And I think international is a kind of uh, very advanced magazine. But still, I mean, I don't know. I, make, I agree with Chiara. I think that in Italy we are still a bit back uh, comparing to, to those examples. But uh, maybe we are, we are recovering. But I think uh, it's also a cultural uh, way of thinking and, uh, in every field. It's not only about journalism. 
Yeah, de definitely, yeah. and I, I don't think it's uh, it's about one particular country because uh, again we, we we always look up to uh, the UK and the US, but in the end it's really I mean it's a small market, so it's really about some uh, people or players being uh, better, but. I don't think it has anything to do with culture or with the state of the market. There is a, a, an agency in Italy, uh, Investival Report, Investigative Reporting, and I don't know the, the name, uh, in Italian it's IRP, mm -hmm. and they made a, a whistleblowing platform, uh, the first Italian whistleblowing platform, mm, two, one month ago maybe. and. Uh, it's a very uh, particular thing and uh, we have to look if uh, it uh, will f mm, works <laughs> or okay. not. Cool. So, um, but again, I mean, the bottom line uh, for individual journalists is uh, don't try to do everything yourself. Uh, try to get as much people around you who can uh, help you uh, work out uh, the, um, the data. Um, my my next point is uh, that the the one thing that you cannot outsource and that nobody uh, can do for you uh, is uh, data literacy. Uh, wh what do I mean with um, with data literacy? Um, again, I'll I'll start with example. Um, so this could qualify as data journalism. You have data. Uh, you have a story. I mean, the story is uh, so. You have uh, the sh market share of Internet Explorer. You have the number of murders in the U.S. Uh, and the story here is that uh, the lower the market share of Internet Explorer, the lower the number of murders in the U.S. So um, seems to make sense, but obviously you can probably get that it's a joke, uh, that there is no uh, relation between Internet Explorer and the murder rate. Uh, if, if you don't believe me, you can just look at the data for uh, 2012 and 2005 and you'll see that the correlation uh, disappears totally so um, and th th this is just a, a joke that was making the rounds on the on the internet uh, another one that I uh, especially like is from France uh, that was 2002 uh, and that's uh, a correlation between uh, the people who voted for the far right uh, in the presidential election and the radioactive uh, fallouts of the Chernobyl um, explosion in 86. Uh, and so here the story is uh, the more uh, ra radioactive, uh, the more fascist the people become. Um, but okay, you can, you can, you can see the, the jokes uh, here. Uh, it's not data journalism. Uh, but my point is that um, some journalists uh, do mistakes that are as uh, big as the one I just showed, uh, but they don't realize it. And that's because they are data illiterate. Um, so just again, to, to look at some examples. Um, in 1995, uh, British uh, journalists uh, made uh, a stupid mistake with data illiteracy that really cost the lives uh, of uh, thousands of uh, British uh, young girls. Um, what they did, wha what happened is, uh, so in 1995, uh, the British Health Authority released a statement saying that uh, the um, contraceptive pill um, was uh, increasing the risk of uh, thrombosis, uh, which is true. Uh, and basically the, uh, the statement uh, was saying that basically the, the risk um, was uh, increasing from 1 in uh, 100,000 to 2 in 100,000, something like that. And what did the journalists do? Uh, they went with headlines saying that the pill doubled the risk of thrombosis, which was true. It went from 1 in 100,000 to 2 in 100,000. Um, the problem is, so what happened, uh, if you see that in the front page of every newspaper they tell you that the uh, pill is bad for you, it's very risky, what you do is you stop taking the pill, so what happened is that in 1996 uh, you had thousands of unwanted pregnancies that led to uh, teenage uh, mothers and to abortions. 
And the problem is that uh, an abortion raises the risk of thrombosis, not by a factor of 1 in 100,000, but by 10 times that amount. So this is a typical example, typical case of not understanding how to report risks. Uh, and this was tragic because it really um, uh, uh, turned the lives of many uh, British girls uh, for the worse. But uh, you see it every, um, everywhere in the, in the media when you have headlines such as uh, ham doubles the risk of cancer uh, or, or the like. Uh, and most of the times uh, it's really about journalists not understanding uh, how to communicate risk uh, or how to uh, understand risk properly. Um, another example of um, data illiteracy uh, is uh, from Russia. Uh, so th this was a work uh, done by uh, the Interfax News Agency. Uh, they created uh, a database of all the uh, churches uh, and religious places in Russia. Um, so you can uh, drill down the data and you have uh, Orthodox churches, mosques, whatever. Uh, but the problem is that most of the churches in the database were actually not in use anymore. So uh, it have been s criticized as being just advertising for the Orthodox Church uh, to make it appear bigger or and more important uh, than it really is. So again, uh, what seems like a uh, harmless database uh, can actually uh, be biased. Uh, and again, it's, it's a case of data li illiteracy uh, because the journalists that published it and that reported on it uh, did not uh, look hard enough um, to the source of the data, who produces it, what's the uh, intention of the people behind it, etc. Yes. Uh, I, I have to check if I understand uh, well the question. Uh, the squared one is uh, the Orthodox Church. Oh, um, and the other one, it's a... Uh no, actually, if you... Um, oops, so that's the, 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 the sort of... Uh, that's a translation of a critical article. Um, but... Um, if, you, if you look at the map... It's really you, you have all the um, all the churches uh, in Russia. Oops. Uh, it's really uh, it aims at being comprehensive. So you have every single church uh, and what cathedrals or whatever. Uh, but you also you, you'll have the mosques and synagogues and uh, and Buddhist temples and whatever. Um, so it really it really looks like uh, the Wikipedia of churches in Russia, uh, but it's actually uh, much uh, much more biased uh, than that. And a third example uh, is uh, much more recent from France. Uh, that was a few months ago. Um, there was a study in uh, New Zealand about uh, they wanted to find out which was more efficient to quit smoking, uh, whether it was the uh, e-cigarettes uh, or uh, patches, uh, nicotine patches. Um, and so the, the New Zealander uh, the, the, the research team from New Zealand uh, published a paper saying that uh, out of the 30 or so people that they uh, worked with, uh, they had maybe uh, 16 that found that the e-cigarette was more efficient, uh, but that in any case, uh, the sample was too small to be statistically significant. Um, and what did the journalists do with uh, such piece of information? Uh, they went uh, with a headline saying that the electronic cigarette was more efficient than the patch, even though the scientists uh, really uh, wrote in their paper that the results were not statistically significant and that they had no idea. So again, a case 
of uh, bad journalism uh, that's due only to uh, data illiteracy. Um, so the problem with uh, data literacy or um, successfully um, uh, thinking critically uh, towards data, uh, the problem is that it's, it's hard to, to learn. Um, you have no immediate uh, payback and it's not like learning a new tool where you can actually produce something right away. It takes, uh, it takes months uh, to be uh, data literate, uh, but you have um, some um, easy, easy ways to, uh, to, to, to get to it. Uh, I, I think the most important uh, things to know uh, are significant digits. So I don't know if you, if you guys uh, know what this is, uh, significant figures. So so uh, data literacy really is um, the, the, the way uh, I, I would define it is really being able to think critically with data um, and to do this um, so mo most people with a science background will find it easy uh, but it's extremely hard when you come from the humanities um, and so my, my point here is to say that uh, if, if you um, learn how to use significant digits, uh, basics in statistics uh, and some critical thinking, uh, it will help you. And so significant digits uh, or significant figures uh, are actually the, uh, it's a way to communicate the precision of a measurement uh, in a number. So for instance, if I tell you um, that you have approximately 300,000 uh, people living in Bari, mm -hmm. uh, you will probably understand that I did not count every, b every single person and that it's a rough uh, assessment. But if on the other hand I tell you you have uh, um, yeah, 315, 675 people living in Bari, then you might have the impression that I actually counted every single one of them because I'm telling you uh, that you have 75 at the end. So surely somebody measured that. Uh, and the problem is that uh, a lot of people use numbers that look much more precise than they actually are. Uh, and uh, it leads to this uh, misconception that measurements are very precise when they're, when they're not. Um, and that's, that's the case of the, uh, the Russian example, for instance. If you add up every single Orthodox church the da in the database, you will end up with a very precise number, uh, but the truth is nobody knows how many churches you have in Russia. Uh, so it's, uh, it's misleading, uh, and what I find powerful with significant figures uh, is that it's something everybody understands. Everybody understands the difference between approximately 2 million and 2 million 206, for instance. So it's, it's a very powerful way to, to communicate the precision of a measurement. Um, the second thing is uh, basic statistics. Um, I think statistics are extremely hard, uh, and that's what that was what, what I was saying about statisticians uh, earlier on. Um, statistics are, are uh, extremely hard, but it's fairly easy to uh, know the very basics. Uh, most importantly, to know about um, the um, how, how to sample a population, how big the sample should be. Uh, what I find often when talking to journalists is that um, w whenever they look at a survey, they will criticize the sample size. Uh, and if you, if you go into basic statistics, you'll realize that the sample size, n the number of people that you uh, ask a question to, uh, is not the most important thing. Uh, and that whenever you uh, ask, uh, I think it's 350 people, uh, then your uh, margin of error uh, is going to fall below 5% and it doesn't uh, fall down uh, any lower after that. I mean, then it takes uh, a, a much bigger sample size to bring the margin of error down. So the number of people, the, s the sample size is really not the most important thing. Uh, what's most important is who you ask the question to uh, and that's really the, the biggest problem in a survey. Uh, it's, it's really about the bias. Uh, so for instance, um, 
if you're doing an online survey, which is often the case nowadays, uh, you're going to miss out on all the population that's not online and maybe they would uh, think differently. So I believe in Italy, it's like everywhere in Europe that 70% of the population is online, something like that. In Italy? Yeah. Okay, so 60. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, my, my point is that whenever you see that a survey was done online, you have to think that 40% of the population had no chance at all to be represented in the survey. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, you have um, other sources of bias. Uh, my favorite one uh, is that whenever you're doing a survey uh, about uh, moods uh, or perceptions of something, something that's really subjective, uh, you tend to have much better results if you ask people after lunch because that's the time of the day where people are happiest. <laughs> uh, so whenever you see a survey about happiness in the world, you have to ask yourself at what time of the day was the survey done? Uh, and if it was done just before lunch, you're going to have terrible results just after lunch, best time of the day. Uh, so that's, that's basic statistics that you don't need a background in mathematics to understand. Um. Chess, oh, see. I think it's uh, very important also the, um, the context of the, the um, uh, knowing, uh, uh, have a very strong knowledge about the uh, territory uh, in which, of which you want to, on which you want to uh, speak about. Uh, I don't know if it's okay yeah, yeah. in English. Uh, I I in general, you're, uh, you're definitely right. Uh, I mean, th but I would, s I would argue that that's the journalistic part. Yeah. But even in terms of statistics, uh, okay. you're right that context is important. Uh, if you have a survey about, uh, let's take the NSA uh, spying affair. Uh, if you, um, let's say you have a question that says, uh, what uh, do you agree with uh, the U.S. spying on us? Uh, and you have this question in a survey. If the question just before is uh, about how uh, how dangerous you think terrorism is, and then you bring the question about the NSA, you're going to have answers uh, that are in favor of spying. If the question just before is about uh, how important do you think freedom of uh, um, communication is, then you're going to have negative answers. Because the fact is that most people don't really care about anything, uh, and they certainly don't care about people asking them questions. So it's very easy to frame the question in a way that you get the answer that you want. So in this, yeah. and this means basically, first, we, we have to take care about the way we make the question, we ask the questions, and the way do we make the, f the question and the formula. And then uh, it also give us, a lot of, let's say, some doubts about how the information w have been collected. Because if there's, if this things influence so largely the information we are collecting, this is, I mean, quite a very interesting problem. Also. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's what I mean. When uh, when whenever you have a data set, uh, try to get as much information as to how uh, the data was collected. And critical thinking is also about uh, why the data was collected. I mean, collecting data costs a lot of money, uh, and nobody is going to do it for the sake of collecting data. Uh, you always have some interest. So most of the time, whenever it's the state collecting the data, uh, the state wants to know how many taxpayers there are, and maybe they want to check if uh, the taxes they are receiving from the population matches the data from the census. I mean, it's not that cynical, but um, that's mostly the, the reason uh, why we have official government data. And that's also, um, that's also a point in connection with open data. Uh, the first census, for instance, was done in Sweden uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, and the goal was really to know how many uh, people could be uh, raised for the army. So uh, it wasn't about sociology or anything. Uh, it's, there is always a good reason to collect data. Um, so, um, to, to, uh, to move on, I uh, wanted to um, give a few tips on how to get started with data journalism. 
Um, the, fir the, the best way to, um, to get started is to uh, reuse what other people have done. Uh, again, I was uh, talking about how you could work in a network. Uh, I think that's part of this spirit of working in collaboration with other people. Uh, so reusing the, the work of others. So yeah, it means what you don't have to, to work from the ground up each time. You can start uh, from a better way. Uh, in terms of um, computer science, you have a lot of free libraries uh, that you can uh, use. So they will take care of the heaviest part of the work. Um, and that's um, just to, to take the example of data visualization. Uh, you have a lot of libraries that you can use, such as D3JS, RaphaelJS, HiCharts, or Chart Builder. These are all open source, all free, uh, and you don't have to to build your own um, your own um, framework all the time. This is a comparison of prices. Um, this is a slide I, I did last week for an audience of uh, like executive level. Uh, s the, the kind of people who buy the Microsoft product, so I think you guys are immune to this. Uh, but just uh, a as a reminder, if you have a 10 people team and you want to buy an Excel license for each one of them, it's going to cost you 8,000 US uh, compared to 90 US for high charts, which is a pretty cool JavaScript library, and zero uh, for the other examples. So again, uh, it's possible to, uh, uh, it's possible to, um, to get started very rapidly uh, and very cheaply. Uh, I, I mentioned before you have a few um, off-the-shelf tools available. Uh, and this was for data visualization, but it also works for uh, mapping, where you have a cartograph. Uh, D3.js now has a mapping solution. Uh, QGIS is another um, uh, geographical information software that's free. Uh, statistical anal analysis, if tomorrow uh, you have the courage to go into statistics, uh, be assured that you have some free tools that exist that will uh, make it easier for you, such as our uh, PSPP and Statwing, which is an online, uh, easy to use kind of uh, statistical analysis tool. And really, whenever you look at, uh, you can be assured that you won't have to pay and that you'll be able to use open source components for your data journalism work. Sorry, we have a question uh, from uh, a streaming uh, yeah. audience. Um, how to convince editors that should uh, hire statisticians, developers, policy analysis and designers? Uh, does data journalism help sell copies, sell copies of magazines? I don't know if I... So, uh, okay. I'll... Uh, I have some slides at the end if, if we have the time on, on the business models of all this. Uh, and the, the bottom line is that uh, it doesn't uh, make wonders in terms of sales. Uh, so that's why uh, you shouldn't try to hire any of these uh, skills, but you should try to work with them uh, from the outside. Uh, and again, I mean, statisticians are a case in point of a skill that you cannot afford, uh, but that will be happy to, to they will be happy to work for you. Uh, it's also a win-win situation because if you uh, give somebody uh, a work that a piece of work that's uh, meaningful and that I mean it, it can brings it can bring them something even though they're not getting paid for it. Uh, for designers, it's um, it's it's a tougher question, and for developers as well. Um, but um, I think it's it's possible to find the resources that you need uh, outside of the newsroom, uh, really. Uh, but it might imply that you will need to uh, advertise the people who um, or to give credit to the people who contributed to the work uh, on the uh, on the news platform and that's where it gets um, difficult for uh, editors who are used to keeping everything in house so it's really about a mentality change but i don't think it's um, i think it's possible to to have these skills without uh, pushing too much money up front So um, uh, an another thing, and, and uh, it, it kind of uh, it's kind of similar to this um, uh, to this idea of how can we work in a newsroom setting about data journalism, is that if you need to do something more than once, uh, you should do a template so you can reuse from your own projects. 
uh, and that's something newsrooms are not used to doing at all. Uh, most of the time, y you don't have a template for your election article, or if you do, you don't boast about it. Uh, you don't have a template for your typical uh, football game. Um, so um, that's, I mean, wh whenever you write, you try not to have templates, uh, but whenever you code or you do data interactives or whatever, you uh, need templates. And these are just a few examples of things that happen all the time. Uh, so I listed here election storms, soccer world cups, flood spires, Olympic games, post investigations, cabinet reshuffles, permitting tournaments, cabinet meetings, cricket world cups, riot hall spills, Apple product launches, Nobel prizes, murder champion links, uh, riots, budget crisis, food poisoning scandals, new car models, and the US bombing some country, uh, which all happen uh, either uh, every four years for the elections to uh, every two years for the US bombing uh, foreign countries. And you don't need to come up with a new fancy interactive all the time. You can reuse a template. And again, if you think about the uh, example from Germany that I showed at the beginning from Tide Online, uh, it was actually a template that they built for the previous election. Or I don't remember if they did it in 2009 or more recently, but the point is, they had it here, and they, don't they didn't need to come up with a new ID because they had it there. They just needed to change uh, the name of the file where the data was uh, stored. So in this case, you have this cool interactive that works in terms of, uh, of bringing the audience on the site uh, with a cost that's approximately zero. Uh, and I mean, it's uh, for elections uh, or sports, the data um, often comes in, uh, in the same format. The same thing is true for Nobel Prizes as well, because we always, uh, before each Nobel Prize, we always have this debate, uh, which country got the most Nobel Prizes, whatever. And it's, it's all every year the same thing. So you can have your template ready uh, to be pushed online with new data all the time. I have a question about uh, data about, uh, data about sport. There is something uh, international database, data warehouse, I don't know, uh, live to, uh, I don't know, Champions Leagues or something like this? Yes, um, so, it, um, so, so you have one company that does that, it's called Opta Sports, uh, and, and they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, they're a new startup, I think they're based in London, uh, and basically what they do is they have uh, uh, people paid to watch sports on TV and just uh, enter information as it goes. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very impressive. Hmm? To be uh, it's really like sweatshop level work and uh, probably to do it in Bangladesh or, or something. But uh, So that's one thing. Um, it, it costs money. I don't know how expensive that is. Uh, probably have to deal with them directly. Uh, but I believe most newspapers have their own or had their own way of collecting sports data. Uh, you also have free alternatives. Uh, I know there is one for soccer. Uh, one database that's uh, that's free for non-commercial use, um, and you have also um, fans. Uh, fans are a huge um, source of data, uh, and most of the time, again, I mean, it, it goes back to what I was saying about working in a network. Uh, if you bring this person that does as a hobby data collection, bring him or her in your team for free, and you just put your his or her name in the article. Uh, and you, you, you would uh, just have saved a uh, thousand euros, something. So no, because if we want to uh, uh, construct a story about uh, the Bari football team, no, uh, because Giuseppe is a very uh, uh, passionate <laughs> about soccer, and uh, f uh, and uh, um, I thought that uh, I don't know how uh, tell these stories because it's a very difficult uh, situation also uh, concerning the uh, uh, business uh, uh, about the, the, the team and the I don't comes up to my mind that it might be a good starting point to make some reports about our local team here for example it's quite it's quite controversial or um, I mean it's very broad um field actually but it opens up a lot of interesting uh, perspectives uh, we, yeah. we need to and think about 
sports is usually a, a great way to uh, to to go into uh, other uh, social stories but because there are lo lots of money involved in it right now yeah. especially i mean italy and lots of clubs now uh in it's reason i mean recent news that inter milan was sold to uh, an indonesian uh, businessman i mean because i mean uh, the financial state of inter milan was not so good and the owner had to sell the team and also i don't know there are some problems with the local team here that from I mean, it's a very interesting local story mm -hmm. uh, uh, th there was um there is a British guy who started, um, I think it's myfootballwriter.co.uk, uh, and he started, uh, basically he was disappointed with uh, the way local newspapers were covering local sport, uh, and so he was a staff writer at, um, at, at the newspaper in Norwich, in, um, in South uh, West UK. Uh, South East, sorry. Um, and so yeah, he started his own venture, and he... Um, he really, uh, first of all, he, he built kind of a database for local sports and it worked great, but I'll, I'll come back with other examples of this. Uh, and, and second of all, he covered only local sports uh, and went for local advertisers. Uh, and so he, um, he was working between Norwich, Ipswich and a, a third, a very small city in, uh, in, in this part of the UK. Uh, but my point here is that um, even if it's uh, hyper local, uh, you probably have a market for it uh, because it's typically s uh, stuff that people care about and that's uh, not being reported uh, well enough in traditional newspapers. Um, so yeah, um, put your templates in one place uh, and this place is GitHub. So whenever you build something that you're going to reuse with a bit of code, go to GitHub. Uh, mm -hmm. And why go to GitHub? So basically GitHub, uh, I don't know if you guys know GitHub. Yeah, the nerds do. Uh <laughs> so for the uh, non-nerds among us, GitHub is a uh, kind of Facebook for code. Uh, it's basically a place where you put all your uh, all your open source code, uh, and you have uh, public profiles and you have company profiles. And why is it important? Why does the Washington Post have its own GitHub account? Is because that's where. Uh, the developers spend a lot of their time uh, and if developers see you and your organization on GitHub uh, then they might want to work for you, work with you. Uh, it's also a great place to hire developers because you have uh, a way to search for people in your area uh, that might be interested uh, in, uh, in the kind of work you do. Uh, so, I mean, GitHub is the way we find our uh, developers. Um, and it's really, um, it's, it's, it's not a place you can avoid if, you, if you're into data journalism. It's where everything happens uh, on the tech side. I, I don't know if you guys would agree with, that, with this description of GitHub that's very uh, uh, purpose-driven. Um, and yeah, finally, defining metrics for success. Uh, we, we briefly talked about uh, is it profitable to do data journalism? Uh, I believe if you just look at the page views, uh, you're going to find it very unprofitable uh, because the, the page views do not, do not uh, justify uh, the investments that are required, uh, even for one single story. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you might find that other uh, ways of measuring success will work. Uh, they can be, uh, I was b talking about at the beginning about a small a Belgian newspaper doing a very small investigation about how much um, uh, politicians were paid. So a way to measure success for this might be uh, the number of articles you have about this uh, investigation, for instance. Um, might be a way to, to measure social engagement uh, on your story. So it's, uh, it's something that needs to be done and that's something that European newsrooms uh, don't do at all, uh, which is kind of sad. But anyway, uh, and structure your own data. Uh, I don't know, maybe we uh, want to break for coffee before that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah.